And now more than ever, we have access to an abundance of information. Navigating this diverse information highway to identify differentiated research and viable investment solutions can be overwhelming. That's why I'm sitting down with business owners and thought leaders to learn a little bit more about what they do and why. Today, my special guest is Doug Wild of Wild Capital Management, a New Jersey-based asset and wealth management firm. I'm Brian Moran, and this is Talk and Shop with Flex Networks. Doug, thanks for being our first guest. This is uh, this is an honor. You're at the the inaugural, maybe the what is going to become a trend around the industry, but trend the side, first, yeah, yeah, yeah we're trend setting. We um, but this is the first time that Flex is bringing together uh, our asset managers as well as us in a, a really unique location here in Burnsville, New Jersey, to go through how you have approach investing and your portfolios and what you've built but it's also uh it's also a time for us to try to revolutionize as i'd like to say or bring to life the art of due diligence right instead of uh, yeah. all of us just going into an office and sitting across from each other at a conference table is there a way that we can bring an on-demand streaming like presence uh to due diligence and in conversations so um thank you Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ryan. For me. I got to ask, you know, last name Wild. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, is it any indicator of the type of manager you are, man? Uh, is it, you no, know, far from it. Far from <laughs> it? How would you describe it? How would you describe yeah, I've, what I've you do? I've never heard anything like that growing up. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Doug. You're a car guy. You definitely got to be... Uh, you got to be a little wild in there. Uh, they, they did call me Wildy uh, in, uh, in college. Okay. Uh, my uh, my ice hockey. We'll teammates. get into that. Yeah, so we'll get into yeah. that. I want to hear yeah. why they were calling yeah. you that. All right. But in all seriousness, tell me tell me a little bit about you know tell me a little bit about wild capital management and and we'll just jump into sort of what what you all do. Wild capital management is was founded by me about five years ago, yep. um, and. Mark Sloss, my um, uh, really just a great colleague, friend, uh, was able to join about four years uh, okay. ago. And we run you know, globally asset allocated portfolios. Uh, we use a variety of, of uh, investment vehicles to, to populate portfolios, ranging from uh, ETFs to actively managed mutual funds. Um, and all of our portfolios are, are tactically allocated. We're yep. tilt, you know, we tilt towards you know, the areas where we see opportunity and away from you know, the areas in capital markets that you know, we believe are overvalued or you know, the fundamentals aren't, aren't that strong. Both Mark and I were at UBS for about a decade. Uh, we, uh, I actually founded the investment management organization there back Within in, wealth management? Within wealth management at UBS uh, in 2004. And that housed all the discretionary uh, portfolios uh, as well as all the model portfolios. We also oversaw uh, the management research department and then all of the execution and trading for, for our accounts there. So, so coming from the wealth management side and running money in-house at the wealth management, what's the experience and the transition been like going from in-house wealth management to now being your own asset management firm? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the big thing is, and this is why we're having this conversation yeah. and why we're, you know, why we're partnering together is, is distribution. Yeah. yeah, we had captive distribution at UBS and, and also previously at Merrill Lynch, uh, where I spent about a decade. The importance of having a, dist a dedicated distribution team uh, is one of the things that we were lacking, and that's why uh, the relationship with Flex and, and your organization is so critical for us, to, for us, for our growth. Running a tactical strategy and having the ability to be global, having the ability to put it all together in a way that meets what's happening in the current environment, but also along with client needs and wants. How does how does it fit into an asset allocation in your opinion? There, there's several dimensions about asset allocation. You know, one is strategic, which is kind of longer term, uh, you know, benchmark allocations. Um, you know, to stocks, bonds, and cash. So more conservative clients tend to have, you know, more fixed income exposure and then more aggressive clients tend to have more equity exposure. Um, and what we do is we tact tactically allocate within those benchmarks. Um, and you know, we do it across all of our portfolios. And so right now, for instance, we've got a tilt towards uh, the United States, uh, particularly um, you know, across really the capitalization spectrum, uh, large, mid, small, um, in some of the portfolios we have, uh, you know, tactical allocations to, to technology, software, uh, and the like. Um, we also have uh, a, a tactical allocation to emerging markets, and particularly emerging Asia, and also broader Asia, including Japan. 
Um, that's on the equity side. And then on the fixed income side, because of the, the rate environment, uh, we, we don't have any international exposure. Uh, all of our exposure on the fixed income side is is to the United States. Uh, investment grade corporate credit, we've got uh, some convertible bond exposure because of the rate environment. You know, obviously we're shorter duration, much shorter duration than the benchmark. Um, and uh, and that'll change when when conditions change. Uh, at this time last year, we were sitting on a lot of cash. We had raised cash towards the end of, of February, um, and we got up to about 25% um, overall cash, and kind of the normal is around two. Moving into technology during the that part of the crisis and what to many felt like, it felt like the end of the world in some cases of how quickly it happened. What what made you, what gave you that confidence to begin that transition into tech and what, what made you think differently than the, the broader market? Yeah, I've been through many market cycles. Um, you know, we, we raised a lot of cash during the technology yep. bust um, and then we out, reallocated about three weeks after the market bottomed uh, way back when, yep. uh, in 2003. And then during the financial crisis, we were raising cash beginning in, in 2000, um, the summer of 2008. Um, and then we, you know, we re reallocated a day after the market corrected on, on March 10th. Um, and yeah, and, and trigger for us back in, during the financial crisis was Timothy Geithner announcing that the 787 you know, billion. Yeah, it's interesting now that we're talking about we're trillions, talking about billions. Now, trillions. We're talking, now we're talking trillions. <laughs> and he made the the announcement that it was going to get deployed. He didn't say how or when, but that yeah. just that it was getting deployed. And you have to understand also during that time frame, you know, we had a, a leadership vacuum in Washington. Um, Obama had just gotten elected. Not his his, his entire cabinet was not. It was a lame duck session. So that was the trigger back in in, in uh, 2009. Um, and you know, this time around, the trigger for us was, uh, first of all, I didn't know how bad the pandemic was going to get. Uh, nobody really knew. But the trigger for us was all of the, one, the Fed was stepping in again uh, and, and, you know, inflating the balance sheet, you know, through, the, through their quantitative easing. Another element was the proposed stimulus, the first tranche of stimulus. And now we're, we're at over <laughs> four trillion in additional stimulus. Um, and if you add it all together, yeah, you, it, it, it's approaching 40% of GDP when you think about, okay, the Fed's balance sheet went from $3 trillion to $7 trillion and they're still inflating it. Uh, and then you add in what, what, the, what the federal government's done in terms of the fiscal stimulus. Yep. And you're looking at you know, 35, 40, or more percent of GDP, which is an astounding number. Is there, so stick with that. That's, I mean, it's interesting, right? Is It's never been, we haven't had this much stimulus relative to GDP since World War II? Maybe the world, yeah. yeah right. It's probably more. And if you think about, okay, 787 billion yeah. um, represented about 5% of GDP back in 2009. Yeah. Right. And so 5% versus 35, 40, whatever the number is. Yeah. So it was obvious that you know, the market was going to bottom. And and because you know the nature of, of how people are are um, conducting business, going to school. Yep. It was pretty obvious that technology was going to be a, a winner, and that's one of the reasons why we, and then probably the main reason why we, you know, had a had a, an allocation to technology specifically, software, and then also, um, you know, with our with the V strategy, which is our our hedge fund. Um, you know, we're playing particular names that are leveraged to the kind of new virtual, you know, reality that we're in. Is the hedge fund yeah. versus the, the 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 allocation products? In portfolios, talk about the difference. Yeah, it's um, we call it the V strategy. I thought Pearl Jam's album Ten yeah. was pretty cool, and I, I thought like, you know, if we could get like halfway there, you know, like V five, you know, yeah. like okay. I love it. I love um, it. But um, anytime Pearl Jam can come into a diner <laughs> conversation about investing, you know, you're in an interesting topic. It's a tactically asset allocated um, uh, strategy that has no constraints. And, but the big difference is that in the bulk of our portfolios, whether it's the ESG portfolios or, or the core or, or our other strategies, you know, there's, we'll, we will go to high levels of cash, but we won't invert. We won't use, you know, this is a different type strategy we'll, where we will go short. You know, we, and, I, and I think the time is what we were talking about earlier, you know, when you see the, you know, the central banks tightening, I think it's going to be a rude awakening. The goal is to participate fully and then some in an up yep. market. Yep. 
and try to protect client capital you know, on the way down, which is what we've been doing in the traditional portfolios for you know, 20 years now. I mean, was there anything over the past year of the pandemic, reflecting back on it, that you feel like missed opportunity within the portfolios or you know, one of the greatest achievements of the portfolios that you run in both the hedge fund as well as the, the managed accounts? Yeah, the, um, I mean, the managed accounts, um, you know, the regret is not being more overweight, obviously, in, you know, in, hind, in, in hindsight, yeah, yeah some of those, um, you know, but, but I feel comfortable because those are, those are portfolios for, you know, for, you know, that are supposed to be stable and not, you know, we don't take a lot of risk with those portfolios, you know, we're, our goal is to outperform our benchmarks, you know, with a reasonable amount of risk and, you know, so I, I feel comfortable with that. Let's talk almost operational due diligence for a second. How has the pandemic shifted how you've operated the business, implemented the and the investment strategy from January of last year to today? Operationally, it hasn't really changed things. Where what has changed as is, is what you and I are doing right now, face to face discussions with you know, with the team um, and, I mean, you know, we do Zoom calls and, you yeah. know, and have, you know, phone calls, conference calls, you know, it's not the same, um, but it is what, you know, it's the environment right now that we're living in. And so, you know, we've been able to adapt I and mean, we were working, you know, a few days virtually prior to the pandemic. So yeah. it wasn't a, a major leap for us. And one of the things that I'm gravely concerned about is, is, you know, the, the younger generation who like kids that are just out of business school or, in their 20s and you know i was fortunate when i was a a research analyst at merrill lynch um as the global uh, strategy group and i had some great 40 50 year olds that really helped me understand the world um and so what i'm concerned about is is that next generation not having kind of the knowledge transfer from the 50 something year olds um yeah and you know i laugh because sometimes you know you know i'm you know 50 plus myself and so like do they really want to listen to me anyway you know but but the reality is i learned a lot from from you know my senior um strategists uh you know over the years and i'm, I'm just concerned that you know longer term that that may be a productivity negative you mentioned some of your mentors who were the people that have influenced your investment style and how you operate today that, that were back in the, those uh, those days when you were in your early 20s just getting going in the business. The first boss that I had at, at Merrill was uh, was Chuck Claw, who was known as the Dean of Wall Street. Yeah. Um, just a super human being. Incredible a, value investor, right? Yeah. He really helped me shape or understand uh, you know, macro factors and what I described earlier and, and you know what prompted us to make um, changes in our asset allocation, you know, either raising cash or you know, going back into the into equities and whatnot. Also, Dave Wilson. Um, oh, yeah. So David Wilson, um, he was the head of um, basically all of the, the stock strategies at Merrill, um, and he's uh, approaching retirement now. So just a wonderful stock picker. Do you handle all the trading yourself? Do you work with an outsourced trading organization? Do you, and then separately. How do you evaluate the actual ETF security itself? What's the process that you take? From a, an ETF selection standpoint, um, you know, it, it comes down to what you're looking for, you know, and and price. You know, that's the one great thing about ETFs is they push the cost curve way down, which is better for investors in the long run. And you've got a lot of, you know, a lot of specialized ETFs. Um, and you know, the, for instance, in, in our hedge fund, we're using leveraged and inverse ETFs. Yeah. And so, and you can do that at the, the aggregate index level. Um, and, you know, they tend to be on the more expensive side, but when you look at it um, through traditional, you know, shorting or, or using leverage, it's, they're, they're less expensive. Um, and then all, you know, there's so many great ETF companies, providers that are, that are creating little niches. It's interesting, this past, this past uh, quarter, when I was looking at year-end numbers uh, through the ICI, Fixed income ETFs had a lot of lot of inflows over the course of the year, uh, even more so if I'm not mistaken or close to or, or near that of open end mutual funds, which historically had dominated the inflows. Right. Yeah. That seems to now that myth that uh, that perception that you couldn't buy fixed income and ETFs seems to be maybe going away. Is it something that you would say is was maybe even unfair uh, that it was treated differently? 
I think they needed to be treated differently okay. um, initially. Yep. So I'll give you a little history back in, in 2005 when we launched uh, the discretionary portfolios at EBS, there were two fixed income ETFs. There was yep. AGG, which is the you know, the, the broad aggregate yep. uh, based on the bar cap aggregate. Barclays, Bar Barclays at the time, yeah. right? And I said, you know, we really need, we really need, you know, investment grade corporate credit, you know, we need, and we need, you know, we need different slices of duration. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then it would be great if you could, you know, do something in high yield and mortgages. And so, because just having those two ETFs, you, you know, we couldn't get the broad diversification nor the tactical yep. then and now you've got, you know, you've got emerging market high yield, you've got emerging market work, local currency, dollar based. Um, You've got um, still a little weak on the international developed side of things. You've got treasuries and and, um, and corporate credit, um, but you don't have it sliced up the way that, that we'd like it. But in the, in the U.S., you can get you know exposure to convertible bonds and preferreds, and and you know you can cut up you know the the, the credit curve and and also the treasury curve, and so you can you can get very close. The one thing, though, that, that people need to understand with fixed income ETFs is they do pick up equity market volatility. Um, and, you know, that's both good and bad. Um, you know, it's bad when you get a downward trending market and it affects some fixed income instruments. Um, yeah. But the good thing about having uh, fixed income ETFs, uh, you know, in a broad array of them, is that it's ultimately forcing price transparency, um, which you don't necessarily have with a mutual fund. Um, and, and you can get out on the day at intraday, as opposed to having to wait, um, you know, until after the close and after the dust settles in some you know, in some cases. So, so on balance, I think there's there are a lot of good things. I think it's for, for saying that I think price transparency is really important. You're able to build diversified portfolios for clients at a much lower price level than than if you're buying individual securities. You got to try something, Doug. This is good stuff. You can't beat a Jersey diner. That's right. Right? Jersey coffee shop, diner. It's a niche that uh, New Jersey has carved. And speaking of a niche, no no better transition to say, what, what's the niche that you're trying to carve out with Wild Capital Management? Because we have an, an investment framework that includes strategic asset allocation guidelines. You know, we've talked a lot about tactical all allocations within those guidelines. Yep. And then we also um, are very transparent about what, what we do and why we're doing it. How do you treat valuation? What's your perspective on valuation when it comes to building a portfolio? We are taking some risk in, in some, some smaller and mid-sized uh, cap names. And so you can, you know, depending on, you have, you have to understand the market environment that you're in. Um, first and foremost, are you in a market environment that's going to reward, you know, you know, loftier valuations or you know are you in a more value oriented market i think we're i think we're migrating more towards value um and certainly we have in the course of the last couple months um but see so you have to understand like the market regime that you're in in certain market regimes you can tolerate how tolerate higher valuations um in the companies that you own um and so and that changes um you know i do look at you know all the common valuation ratios i look at them uh, in, in an absolute sense, I look at them you know, relative to you know, their trends, and I also look at them relative to their industries or sectors, as well as the overall market. And you know, I look at long time series, and some of the names that we own have only been around for four or five years. Um, but the longer the time series, usually the more you can glean out of it. Thinking about how you build a portfolio, I know a lot of, in a typical due diligence meeting, a lot of time is spent around walk us through how you Put together the allocation. How do you build out a cons a moderate and a moderate portfolio, moderate risk portfolio, for example? What, how would you walk an analyst through that? I mean, it really starts with um, you know expectations for risk and return, investment returns that are consistent with an investment cycle, um, and then and then also you know accordant risk. We approach it you know through a traditional modern portfolio theory. Um, and the efficient fr frontier curve, yep. and so the benchmarks that we use are you know, the, the Russell 3000 um, for the okay. U.S. broad broad equity, 
um, EFA for even and emerging markets, um, so basically the Acquiex US for yeah. international, and then we we have to mix um, the ag, the US ag, and, and the international ag because there really isn't a good global global um, index to work with for for US clients. Yeah. Um, so there's the macro. Yeah. The macro is established. You build that top yep. down. That's the structure. Yep. A really strong overweight would be, you know, a ten percent overweight to equities or fixed income. Or cash. <laughs> do, you, what are the, from, do you have maxes and limits to it, it's really, position it's, size or it, sector size? Well, from a from a compliance standpoint, um, there really are no limits per se. But okay. you never want to you never want to take a client from being a conservative client to being a overly you know, aggressive. moderately aggressive, or you know. So, so we kind of tend to stay within ten ten percent. Um, which is still reasonable. We, we haven't really gotten there. Uh, we've gotten there from not from the initial tactical um, allocation, but yep. we've gotten there from you know being overweight equities or underweight equities market and, and, and market movement. And dry, yeah, exactly. And for a variety of reasons, whether it's you know valuation, whether it's the, the prospects for you know, economic recovery. I don't want to call it a historical month, not necessarily. 1994-ish when it comes to rates moving, but it feels pretty significant to bond bond investors right now, right? Yeah. How would you, how does that play out for equities? Because typically, obviously, interest rates do influence equity results over time. Oh, yeah. And, you know, when does, is there a level? Do we have to hit 2%? How do you look at what we've think, gone through and what could be? Yeah, 2% cost? will be a you know, an eye opener. I yeah. mean, when you go from 50 basis points in August last summer, that's a big move from a, you know, from a capital destruction standpoint in the, yep. in the fixed income markets. And it's been very, uh, very, you know, challenging for, for bond investors in the United States and, and elsewhere for that matter. You talked about negative yields, you know, what's the point? Um, and, you know, 2% is a, you know, it, 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 it's a psychological like wall. Um, but if you look at, you know, the, the, the yield on the, the 10 year should be about 200 basis points, at least historically it's been about 200 basis points higher than real GDP. So kind of in line with GDP given, you know, the Fed's 2% uh, forecast yep. for inflation. That's a shocker, right? So we should be right now, you know, right now is, is you know, it's, it's an aberration, but like in, if we were in a steady state at this time last year, um, prior to the pandemic, rates probably, like historically, they should have been like at five and a half percent because we were at about three, three and a half percent GDP, real GDP growth. But because of what we we're just talking about, low rates in Europe, low rates in Japan, you know, alternative benchmark rates are so much they're, they're an anchor keeping our rates down. And so the real thing for us uh, to pay attention to and be wary of is is how rates are moving in, in the rest of the world because that's kind of underpinning. How, how much we can climb. Not that you're risk on, risk off, momentum investor by any means, but what, what's, what would make you go risk off again at this point in the cycle where we are? So, I mean, the Fed's the most important central bank in the okay. world. Any indication, and you know, every Friday, you know, the, the Fed balance sheet's released. And so if we start to see a, you know, right now it's ticking up, yep. um, and has been, and they've been very, um, they've been very good and transparent about, about their purchases. Yep. Um, I'm talking about momentum. Yeah. When you start to see it, it change, and either it plateaus or, you know, heaven forbid, you know, um, starts to roll over, um, that'll be an indication that, you know, they're, they're considering their more public communication to be more hawkish. Um, and so that's probably the most important um, piece of monetary information that, that I think investors should pay attention pay to. Pay attention to yeah. right now. Yeah. Let's switch speeds and just talk talk about, um, I guess it's two topics, but it's relating to diversity and inclusion. Right? A topic that is one both uh, top of the news cycle on a daily basis, but has now made its way to the investing world, it's made its way into corporate world, it's made its way into everyday life discussions. So looking at it from two ways, uh, as a, and as a small business owner and somebody growing a company just like you, um, you know, I think about it every day from how do we build our culture around DNI? How do we build the right employees and the right teams and ensure that we do try to grow that? But separately, how does, how do, from your perspective on top of that, how do you look at investments you're considering? It's a great topic. Um, and you know, there's, 
we've been involved in, in environmental, social, uh, and governance-related investing for about a decade. Um, you know, my partner Mark Sloss is really a luminary in, in the space, and and you know those sorts of considerations, um, you know, diversity, inclusion, and, and we've broadened it out to include some of the sustainable development goals, yep. are really important aspects of running a company, yep. um, and. But we've found over the years that the ESG investing is it's just smart investing. But the discipline of investing um, through that lens is is one you're you know, you're potentially avoiding you know fines if you you know are in a business that you know has environmental impact. Um, you know, reputational so, aspects. Yeah, of that. Um, you know, societal issues, you know, including you know diversity inclusion. You know. Those are, are, are good things. You want a robust, as you mentioned earlier, robust culture uh, in your organization. Um, and then finally, governance. Like you don't you don't go and pick companies that are poorly covered and invest in them. You know because ultimately you'll you know they'll, you'll step on a landmine. Um, and so I think they're all really you know, smart things from a from a corporate standpoint. And it's just doing, it, you know it's doing the right thing um, and the, and getting rewarded for the right thing. Yes. Right. What drove you to get into investing the way you have, right, in the business, but also then what drove you uh, to get excited about starting your own company? The way that I approach investing is, it's been an evolution. You know, I mean, it started way back when in my, you know, my research days and, you know, under Chuck Lau and Dave Wilson. Were you always just curious? Always curious, most fascinated about what's going on in the world. And um, I mean, that's the one great thing is that there's always something you can do. Um, and you know, given where, you know, where trends are going, yep. um, you know, so it's been a, you know, it's been an evolution. Um, yeah, in terms of, you know, starting WCM, um, you know, I always wanted to start my own firm, and you know, a lot of my colleagues have done it, um, and I felt it was time. You know, I'm, I'm, yep. you know, I was. Getting approaching fifty, and I was kind of like, okay, you can do this now, or you're never going to do it. And so you're being humble right now, and I know you would be humble the whole time. But you had a, I mean, knowing you from your UBS days and getting to know you in the recent months, you had a thousands of advisors and yeah. their clients that followed your investment lead. Um, you were one of the most followed investors at the firm, right? And I think I think that that reason is why. Uh, is one of the most exciting things that's got to be happening within building your new firm today, just with the opportunity and how many folks you've led to investment success over the years. What would be your advice to somebody considering starting their own firm or becoming an entrepreneur and the lessons you've learned over the past few years? Persevere. Um, <laughs> um, keep it's going. Killer. It's killer. Like, you got to have resilience. Yeah. You don't let the down days get you down too much. Everybody yeah. can have a down day and, and don't let the... You know, the great days, you know, you know, get you too overconfident. Appreciate you taking the time to do this today, and I can't wait to get some feedback from all those that see uh, and learn a little bit about WCM, Wild Capital Management. All right, great. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. All right. All right. All right.